Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined in person by our Chief Product Officer, Kenny McKenzie. Kenny, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, man. Good to have you here. He, he normally sits somewhere up there in behind where we're recording today. And uh, yeah, I've, I've wanted to get him on the show for a while. I think I've mentioned on the podcast at least a couple of times uh, that Kenny and I have been working together on things. And um, really what we want to, what I want to get Kenny, what I wanted to invite you here to do was actually share a little bit about sort of what we're doing around the Outbound Labs um, and specifically getting into the process around our Outbound Validation program that you've helped, that you've basically developed here. Um, yeah, sure. So before we jump into like, you know, sort of the story behind it, why don't you provoke, like, can you tell us a little bit about your, your background? Cause you're an entrepreneur, <laughs> you've been with us for a year, year and a bit now. Um, but why don't you just give us a little bit of a history of, you know, where did, where did Kenny come from, uh, from a product and engineering perspective? Cool. Um, sure. So I uh, founded a company called Vendrico, um, and, uh, basically helped grow that company, bootstrapped it up to a six-figure revenue. Um, but we made some mistakes when it came to product market fit and um, basically struggled to get sustainable traction in the market. Um, and like so many other startups, basically, you know, had to, had to um, call it an end, call it a day. Mm -hmm. um, and basically from learning through that experience, I realized that product market fit is really hard and it's the crux that most uh, businesses struggle with and I basically set, set out a mission set myself out on a mission to uh, try and understand it as best as I could and basically help other people avoid that mistake um, so I've spent uh, spent about a year and a half um, doing deep research into it interviewing a lot of entrepreneurs and, and running a lot of my own experiments and uh, just consuming a lot of content like put out by com uh, organizations like Y Combinator uh, and uh, really just trying to fill in that gap. And so coming to Predictable Revenue, my hope was to further that learning and, and help Predictable Revenue design better products and services for our markets. Cool. I, I, and I think one of the things that sort of, I don't know, resonated with me was that sort of we both had had this, these sort of failures in our lives. Um, but from like, di we both kind of failed at the same thing, but we did, we did it quite differently. Right, like on on my side, we had sort of uh, we we were able to kind of sell. You know, we were better, maybe better on the sales side of things, um, and we totally messed up sort of some of the product side of things. Whereas you guys had really nailed the product side of it, like the actual engineering product side of things. Yeah. But it, it was more on the sales side and like on the go to market that uh, that I think was where some of the gaps were. Yeah, well, I mean, ultimately we uh, developed a really uh, cool cutting edge piece of software, uh, but it just didn't, uh, wasn't perfectly aligned with what the market needed and uh, we addressed, uh, missed some gaps basically in the market. And uh, so, yeah. It's funny because we did the, I feel like we did the opposite with Carb. Yeah. It's like we had built something that was, that the market really needed and wanted. Um, we just we just didn't really execute um, from a, a whole company perspective on um, like actually building the product, making good decisions. Um, and I, and I'm I'm saying this not to throw our engineers or product manager or product whatever under the bus. Like I'd say most of the 90% of the port of the bad decisions like rest on my shoulders. Um, and so I'd, that's easy easy an easy rounding error to say it was basically all my fault. And I'm, <laughs> I, I'm yeah I'm saying that to sort of own it. I don't want to put it on other people. I know it was a whole team, mm -hmm. but we kind of did we sort of failed at for the opposite reason is we had sort of stumbled on this product opportunity, but we didn't really, um, didn't really execute. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's interesting cause you know, I see variations of this in the customers that we've worked with. Sometimes I feel like I'm talking to myself from seven years ago mm -hmm. where, you know, they have maybe some product ideas, uh, maybe some market hypotheses about, Oh, well, I think this market's going to be really great for this, or it's not going to be really great for that. Um, and, and they come to us and they say, hey, well, we want to we want to scale. We need to sell. We've raised some money or we're bootstrapped this and we want to find a way to get new customers. You know, we've all of our customers have come from this channel and typically it's inbound or like referrals, our network. But now it's time for us to sort of grow and mature and sort of take that step between from like being a, I guess, founder driven revenue centric to actually building real customer acquisition channels. And I, I think the number of times, you know, we've been doing this for six years now, 
um, in terms of helping companies build sales teams. And I think the number of times where I've seen a company come to us and it and the website looks cool and they've got some case studies, and then it the first campaigns we run for them, they're they're like, okay, it's these these are the customers that, we, that they need to go after, mm-hmm. and then it's just crickets. Right, and you're testing, and it's like you're, you know you're testing a couple campaigns, you're testing a bunch of different messaging, you're trying to figure out where where are we fucking this up? Yeah, right. And then four months in, all of a sudden, you know, the strategist has figured out, okay, well, it's this piece, that piece, this piece, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden things are up and to the right. And sometimes those customers are like, hey, great, you figured it out. And other times they're like, f you, it took way too long for you to figure it out. What yeah. the hell? Yeah. I think for me, like the the thing that like the light bulb went off when a friend um, uh, recommended a book called Competing Against Luck, and uh, I learned about something called Jobs to Be Done Theory, which is basically a way of framing uh, the what I guess what I consider is like a, almost a reflection of a product or service's features. Um, you know, a lot of people might call it things like benefits, but um, there are ways using Jobs to Be Done Theory to break it down into like more explicit chunks. And ultimately, it can be used in two ways. It can uh, be used uh, to help make things people want or help make people want things. And uh, I think when you know, thinking about it through the lens of a product manager, your obviously primary goal is to make things people want. And when you're trying to market a product that already exists, your goal is to make people want your product. Um, and ultimately, this drop speed on theory sort of insight or lens was the thing that got me on this track and, and has helped me better understand uh, market fit and I think ultimately help uh, innovate some of our services. Cool. A uh, quick sidebar for people that have listened to more than a couple episodes. I have brought up Clayton Christensen's milkshake video a couple of times. Yeah. He was actually the author of Competing Against Luck. That's right. Um, don't read the book. Just watch the milkshake video. <laughs> <laughs> it's. I just love the analogy of the milkshake. Yeah. Um, so, so why don't we zoom in a little bit and talk to me about how we got to where we are today? And like, let's talk a little bit about the story of sort of the the realization that you know, hey, our core metrics are sort of eroding, yeah. and then how we kind of painted the path to or paved the path to getting better at that first sort of four to five months, um, so that we don't have to wait, you know, six months and maybe get it right. Because what what I think. It, you know, if you're listening to the the episode, what I'm hope you what I hope you pull out of this is Kenny is the Kenny's ability to through the program that he's designed for us um, to really quickly get to an answer around validating your target account list, right? So if you don't know, if you can't tell me, okay, these are the my these are my top five, these are my top twenty, top hundred, top thousand, etc. We've got a methodology, or Kenny's actually developed a methodology for helping figure out and get some data that will back up. This is why you want to go after these individuals. Here's why, and here's how you reach them. Right. So that's that's what I think is going to be the key takeaway of our conversation today. Sure. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I'd say the story begins when uh, you know I was trying to figure out how do we improve sort of the our. our flagship service, which at the time was Accelerate, and like Colin had mentioned, um, you know, we had some a percentage of our clients that uh, were just taking a little too long to get results, like they, in terms of what they uh, provided us and feedback, mm-hmm. and a deep dive into our metrics, and specifically going back historically uh, a few years, and how that's changed over time. And I think one of the sort of key discoveries we made was that, uh, and I think a lot of people have felt this, but we got some really good hard data behind it. Um, is that the sort of response rates in email were declining, and sort of our understanding of that has to do with how people, you know, basically culturally behave, and the fact that uh, as years ago it was just a lot easier to engage people randomly and get them on a call. They're a lot more patient. They're a lot more open-minded to things like that. But everybody over the years has gotten really worn out. It was, that, well, it was so unique back then. Exactly. Right. Nobody had seen this before, and so as a customer acquisition channel, it was it was open season. Yeah. Right. But uh, like any sort of um, channel in marketing that uh, works really well, more and more people flock to it, and it sort of equalizes over time. Uh, and so that bar, basically, in terms of uh, what you had to do to get someone to you know hop on a call with you or basically engage with you in a positive way, uh, has been risen uh, up quite substantially to the point. But it, but it's still possible. It's just you need to be a lot more thoughtful about um, introducing yourself in a particular way and making sure that you're focusing on the right people and not just sort of uh, blasting everybody. Mm-hmm. So. Um, 
basically what we, just kind of taking a step back, looking at sort of innovation as a whole, um, our goal was how do we uh, you know, improve this metric of, of getting our conversion rates back up, and particularly what do we do about sort of the declining channel of email, uh, and, and help ensure that our clients get uh, results faster. So those are sort of the three main uh, challenges. And, and I want to say too that there was like a pretty significant emotional uh, factor involved in this in that like our strategists like are uh, really uncomfortable when a client's not getting results. Like we really own that and, and sometimes it can feel a little bit like it's outside of your control when you know you're doing everything that the client shared with us and uh, we're basically following uh, the targeting messaging strategy that um, you know they had uh, believed in in the beginning but it's not working um, and so we just really wanted to be able to uh, provide our team with uh, to more tools to be able to overcome that situation and, and basically get out of that uncomfortable comfortable dynamic where you know both our clients and our team uh, aren't happy because things aren't working mm -hmm. yeah I mean in this case it's like customer success metrics have a direct correlation to company or employee happiness metrics absolutely uh, it's there it's every time we uh, we survey the team we talk to anybody the number one thing that stresses them out is like if, if they have a client that's not performing yeah and that's um, yeah and so basically the thing I love about this is it was you know, in the past, I think we were just, we did a lot of, even though we would run people through the niche workshop from that sort of Aaron uh, developed um, as part of Impossible to Inevitable, or that was documented in Impossible to Inevitable, um, but I, I feel like it, it became, we were a little bit too maybe passive with the clients, and it was, you know, you sometimes you get those clients that are just like, oh no, I know what this is, I know what this is, I know what this is. And the thing I liked about the, uh, about what we call outbound validation, um, is that it basically, it breaks it down into a chain. And so now we, we've got sort of like a scientific lens to look at it through. Mm -hmm. But it's made, it's made our team a lot better at sort of getting to that magical moment of, aha, this is taking off, yeah. right? Because if in a world where you, you know, where everybody can send, you know, send emails. And I think, I don't know, somebody was, like if, I think if you look at, you know, organizations that have, you know, have more than a couple SDRs, it's almost fair to say that their sales development team could be spending more emails than their marketing team, mm -hmm. right? Like in that world, and we all know how many emails like marketing sends, especially if you have a big list, you know, in, in a world like that, like everybody is getting these types of emails. And so, like you said earlier, the bar is just so much higher, yeah. right? And so, and I think that's one thing that, you know, it maybe took us a little while to realize um, and real and just figure out a way of actually, you know, implementing a good solution for that. Because yeah. it's, it's one thing to say, okay, well, email's degrading, great, just send more email, mm -hmm. right? But that's that doesn't do anybody any favors at the end of the day. Of course not. It makes everything harder for everybody. A hundred percent. And I, I'd argue it almost makes it worse because it's mm -hmm. in some ways, and we were guilty of this as well. Is it was it was sort of the lazy approach, mm -hmm. right? And and I don't, and I'm not trying to call people lazy. Like if anything this falls on me in terms of not being able to evolve the organization uh, fast enough to sort of catch up and keep up with the trends. Um, but I think the, you know, coming into the sort of the outbound validation project, which we call OV, you know, if you, if you hear us referring to OV, we mean outbound validation. Yeah. Um, basically the thing I like about it is just the ability to get super specific, right. And having a very personal conversation, um, sort of at scale, right. It's not, you know, the, the next layer on top of that would be sort of going and personalizing every individual conversation. This is a method for really dialing in and getting super honed about who you're going after and why. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a bit more complex than that, but these are the things that I like about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like there's a, there was a realization, I forget exactly when it happened. I think, you know, there was a lot of internal discussion going on and a lot of people and get involved in that. So, um, you know, I can't definitely can't take full credit for it, but I think collectively we realized we needed a better way of getting our clients to those results faster. Um, and, you know, if we were to distill it down into sort of like the first principles of what's going on, you know, really breaking things down back to the basics. Um, you know, one of the realizations we made was that there's really these four critical components to uh, outbound um, and generally marketing, um, but, but obviously for outbound as well. And it's um, targeting, messaging, uh, channel and tactics. And basically the targeting is how you isolate um, a group of people that all want the same thing happens to be your product or, or something that's connected to your product. Um, and the messaging is basically how you start the conversation with them um, to get them engaged, to you know, basically see you as a, a tool or something that's interesting to them that they can, uh, that can help them get what they want. 
Um, and then the channel is basically where are you starting that conversation? Um, like, are you doing it on, on a social media platform or via email or with, I call them cold or at a conference? Uh, and lastly is the tactics you follow. So these are, you know, like sort of the last mile of optimization, things like tool, like automation tools, CRMs, uh, how you structure your team, how your hiring plan, comp plan, um, you know, sort of it's, it's more about scaling and optimization at that point usually. Um, and so by kind of looking at it through that lens, we realized that it was really the targeting and the messaging uh, that was taking us too long to figure out for certain clients. And then uh, obviously there was a bigger question around channel. And so how we solve these problems, uh, we, we actually follow two completely different paths uh, to solving these. So um, I guess before I get into that, uh, do you have any other questions about kind of the lead up into that? No, I, I think you did a pretty good job of sort of summarizing. We could go deeper on, on certain things, but I think you sort of teed up the sort of four pillars. Yeah. Like, why don't we why don't we jump in? Sure. Um, so I'd say, like, I think the thing that actually happened first was um, the channel, because that was something that we were pretty confident would affect all our clients. Uh, some of our clients would get, you know, start seeing results pretty early, but we thought, how can we get them better results? Or, you know, maybe they'd get some results, but it just wasn't quite what we'd hoped. So it wasn't zeros, but, you know, it was maybe half of where we wanted them to be, something like that. Mm -hmm. So we we're trying to figure out, like, how can we improve our conversion rates? Um, how can we ultimately, you know, uh, t touch fewer, p get the same results or more meetings booked um, for our clients while touching fewer prospects, um, basically upping conversion rates? And, and ultimately how, um, yeah, how, how to improve our metrics across the board. And so we looked at it by trying to follow the, uh, the scientific method. And I should say maybe before I get into that is that um, the company was full of ideas. Like everyone in the company had some ideas around how they thought we could improve metrics. Mm -hmm. um, but what we needed was a structured program to harness those ideas and, and be able to execute on them efficiently. And uh, part of the challenge was that we didn't know which ideas would work and which wouldn't. And uh, in hindsight, uh, uh, more, most of the ideas, the majority of the ideas we had didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but what uh, I think the power was is, is in sort of the process that we followed. And I'll just add on to that because 100% it was the process. We had you know, so many creative and smart, intelligent individuals here that were doing their research, they were doing their homework, checking out blog posts and trying things. Yeah. And they'd, they'd read this blog post that, or uh, something they'd see on LinkedIn and they'd try and replicate internally and we'd get no results. Yeah. Right, we kind of we sort of I don't know jumped exactly. around and like sort of f were fishing in the dark, so to speak, um, and and I think there was two things that that we didn't that we uh, sort of were missing that cl that once we kind of ha started heading in this direction, um, helped things really click for us. Mm -hmm. And I think one was we didn't really have a collective metric that was the one most important metric. Yeah. Right and. Um, I think it was around about this time last year, we really started, I think we decided that it was the number of people that we needed to touch to book a meeting. Yeah, I mean, that was, that's definitely a critical one that um, we weren't paying attention to. Um, you know, I think that and the just total number of meetings booked, mm -hmm. balancing those two, of course, because ultimately, you know, if we're being super efficient in our conversion rates, but our clients aren't getting meetings booked, they're not happy. Yeah. Um, but the combination of those two metrics, I think, was the balance we were looking for. For sure. Yeah. And, and it wasn't that we weren't paying attention to metrics at, at all in the first place. You know, we, I think we'd actually gone too far in terms of um, wanting to wanting to measure ourselves by the metrics that our customers cared about, yeah. which ultimately, at the end of the day, is closed deals. Mm -hmm. And before that, it's pipeline. And before that, it's booked meetings. And I think we'd skewed too far towards, OK, customers just care, care about closed revenue. Um, but it was, it, it was it's, in a perfect world, it's the right metric to look at. Uh, but in reality, it was very challenging to, um, to actually get accurate reporting. And I'm not saying it's the wrong metric to look at because of that, but I think in terms of getting um, having that sort of collective company metric is too inconsistent to be something that you can really align and drive the company behind. Yeah. Right. And so having the having that one sort of north star metric um, in terms of okay, we need to really increase the quality uh, of our approach, and then having a process for systematically learning and testing out these ideas that we're having and things that we're reading on blog posts. I think those were the two things that really got the ball rolling for us. Yeah. Yeah. So basically the first sort of major step we took was what we're, what we've been calling outbound labs. 
and uh, Lavinia Hicks, uh, you know, very early on stepped up and has helped drive, drive the, the development of that program. And she, uh, you've probably seen her or potentially have seen her in some other videos. Yeah. Shout out to Outbound Labs. It's on, yeah. you, on, on our YouTube channel. Jump yeah. in there, subscribe. Lavinia's amazing. She goes like on a, not weekly, but we try and launch sort of like a series of four, four to five uh, episodes every month or two. Uh, basically, anytime we have relevant tests that come through, we try and we want to make sure that we're sharing all that. And so it's not just like leaking out on the podcast every now and then. It's we've actually got Lavinia on here. And um, so go definitely check that out. Yeah. And, you know, that does really about going back to those four pillars, you know, targeting, messaging, channel and tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we really see as Outbound Labs helping us drive uh, the channel and tactics, which frankly, we kind of come to find that um, they don't vary too much from company to company. I mean, there's always, um, you know, customized sort of optimizations to make, uh, but usually that's sort of the last 20%. Uh, the first 80% of results tend to come from, you know, what's working best for your market. Um, and so, you know, if, depending on your business, you might be going after a different market um, than, some, than another company. And so that might have a, fa um, a sort of a factor of which channel you should use. Um, but a lot of the clients that we work with are going after similar markets or markets that all happen to uh, do well with the same channel. And so uh, some of the insights, you know, gleaned from Outbound Labs has really helped us drive, push up the metrics across all our clients. Um, but I think what we're really here to talk about is more so the uh, Outbound validation side, mm -hmm. um, which is really the focus on the targeting and the messaging. And how do we basically figure that out faster? And so um, the, the, you know, the interesting thing and the reason why I mentioned Outbound Labs, and I think it's worth mentioning that in general in this conversation, is that both Outbound Validation and Outbound Labs is we're doing our best to follow the scientific method. And so what I mean by that is that you know, we make hypotheses, um, or better yet, we, first we kind of come up with a broader theory, and then we try to break that theory down into certain uh, specific hypotheses that we can test. We design uh, experiments to test them, and we evaluate the results, sort of consider what we learned, and then go back and try and fold that into you know, basically repeating the process. And so with Outbound Labs, we're doing that for you know, uh, experiments that test you know, uh, which channels perform better under which circumstances, you know, what sort of tactics around Tar targeting messaging sort of patterns that aren't specific to a single client, things like that. Uh, a lot of stuff to do with deliverability and sort of better understanding channels that we're using. Um, but uh, with outbound validation, we're a lot more focused on simply the targeting and messaging strategy for a very specific client. Mm -hmm. So what we learn from that uh, tends to be very, very specific to that client and doesn't apply to anybody else, um, but uh, it helps them see results faster. Um, yeah, so I guess I could dive into how we do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, yeah, I think that'd be a good a good place to start. Is just okay. like talk a little bit about, um, and because we obviously like we haven't planned this as a as an ad. We want this to be sort of instructional. We want yeah. this to be. We're trying to open the kimono and, and share a little bit about the process. We've got a couple blog posts that Kenny's written um, that we'll link to in the uh, in the show notes. Um, we've also got. We're trying to not like uh, share a bunch of the documents that we use to run Outbound Labs. Um, so we've got some slides that we can share. Uh, we've got some documents that we can share in terms of the blog post where you document the process. Um, we're going to have our writer do a write-up of this episode um, and publish it under my name to make me look smart. <laughs> um, and then we, we've got some of the docs that we actually use to run OV um, that we'll share. And so I want you to you know have a look at those, follow along um, as we go, yeah. um, and just yeah, if you've got questions, feel free to reach out to Kenny or I uh, throughout the process. Obviously, you're not on the uh, on the recording as we're doing this, so you know, hit us up on email. LinkedIn is probably the easiest way because uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. And if you've got if you're struggling with something, or if you've got a question about this or that, or if there's something you feel like we missed, hit us up there so that we can make sure that we're we're here to help. Yeah. Cool. All right. So uh, let's dive in. Talk talk to us about where do we start in uh, up with an outbound validation project. Yeah, so I think like before I sort of just dive right into the, the process, which I'll speak to in a moment, I just want to kind of explain a little bit about how uh, sort of the story started for us, because I think that context is important. Like as we mentioned, uh, you know, we're trying to basically get to that uh, sweet spot with a client sooner so that they could start seeing metrics and really it boils down to targeting and messaging. And when we realized this, um, you know, our current uh, head of the outbound validation program, uh, Robert Heaver, uh, basically put his hand up and, you know, uh, really wanted to help drive and figure that out. Um, and so we realized that we could have this new offering that helped us sort of uh, get, make, derive these insights as quickly as possible. And so, you know, Rob was quite instrumental in, you know, throughout the process of this program being developed. And what I'm about to share, I think, came from 
uh, sort of a combination of us working together in terms of you know me coming with some product management theory and him applying that and 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 basically uh, testing it with clients and executing on it and and getting to a point where we found a convergence of being able to offer a lot of value for our clients while also being able to do that profitably in a way that was sustainable for the company um, because as like you whenever you develop a new product or service obviously it takes a little while to get the business model flowing and 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 every the val the sort of transfer of value between you and the client and the client back to you in a way that's all balanced and works for everybody really well so mm -hmm. um, and I think with that in mind like basically where it started was uh, just this sort of deep passion for trying to figure out um, you know for any given client uh, but one, you know one we're working with in this uh, with this service is who uh, who ultimately are going to be the clients that are the easiest to close. So we obviously a lot of people talk about that as the ICP, mm -hmm. right? But being more thoughtful about that and specifically drilling into specific personas. And the way we think about it is, um, it's a group of people who are all trying to get the same job done. And I don't mean that in terms of like job description, like, you know, I'm a product manager or I'm a sales manager. Well, don't, we don't mean by that jobs. We mean like more explicit things, like breaking it down explicitly to that like specific step of desired progress that, you know, one of our clients might be best suited to help them make that progress. And we find that the, the desired progress and the context and the obstacles they face are all relevant. And so when we started, we were basically just trying to figure that out the best we can. And through sort of a lot of ra uh, rapid experimentation and trying lots of different things and seeing how it worked, what we realized was, you know, if we're removing the channel variable from the equation, we're focusing on just targeting and messaging. There is a benefit to using email because it is a really low cost channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, compared to, you know, let's say reaching out to people, showing up at their office in person or, or uh, calling them or, you know, you can basically touch more people faster. Um, well, and it's more, you, you can actually get statistically significant data exactly. or closer to yes. versus say on the phone yes. where there's so many other variables like time of day because you can't make two calls at once. Yes. So, so one of the sort of early res realizations was just that um, we would be able to provide a lot more value to the clients actually uh, if we uh, used the email and then basically used it as a benchmark. So even though the, the sort of conversion rates across the board were declining uh, and had declined significantly since when Predictable Revenue, the book, was published, um, the difference was that you know we could still get meaningful results uh, that you know maybe wouldn't be quite as good as if you'd employed like a multi-channel strategy or use more channels, but it allowed us to kind of control variables and isolate um, just the right targeting and messaging mix because even though the conversion rates are lower, we could still get statistically significant sample sizes, like you mentioned, um, and notice real patterns and see like basically which combinations of targeting and messaging stood out among the rest. Well, and I think the the there's a really important difference, right? In in the beginning, we're trying to learn, right? Right. And once we figured out, okay, which which of the which of these markets, which of these hypotheses turned out to be correct, then we can go into sort of execution mode. Yeah. But you need to start in learning mode, and I think that's exactly. the it's an important step that I see a lot of people trying to skip, yeah. which is, well, I have all these guesses, I just want to go and start. I want to start right now. Yeah. I I like. I'm told I need sales. You know, I'm looking at the balance sheet, and like I understand. Like, I'm, I, we've both been entrepreneurs. Like, yeah. I understand the pressure of trying to close and get some more revenue. This is one of those things where the pressure causes you to skip steps, and when you skip steps, you're you're just you're running such a huge risk of, you know, point like pointing your sales team in the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, so we kind of like, or the way I've been thinking about it at least is this cost versus yield equation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, email and using literally just email um, and, and, and testing with, you know, loosely researched lists sounds like terrible practice. And, and for the most part, it is if you want to optimize your results. But if what you're trying to do is speed up your learning, it actually provides a significant sort of benefit um, when you compare it to uh, the multi-channel strategy. And so when you look, think about that sort of cost versus yield uh, equation where you've got sort of email uh, on one end, low cost, low yield, and then you've got multi-channel, like, um, you know, following best practice in terms of how you set up your team. You got a, a fully full suite uh, sales development team that's uh, multifunctional with dedicated researchers, dedicated inbound reps, dedicated outbound reps, and all these things. Like that's obviously very expensive, so it's very high cost, and it could provide a very high yield, but only if you're focused on the right 
targeting a messaging mix. Basically, only if you've nailed your sort of market fit. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of clients that sort of wish they had nailed their market fit. Maybe they've assume, they assume they've nailed, nailed their market fit. They don't have any proof of that. It's mostly wishful thinking. And uh, and so to dive right into that like really big investment can be a bit risky. For sure. And 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 I don't want to just like slag on our customers here. Because, oh, of course not. Like a lot of them, you know, you have they'll have reasons to believe. Okay, it's this, it's this, it's that. Yeah. Um, where I think our job, our responsibility here is we kind of, it's the, I don't know, the burden of proof, you know, rests on us. Yeah. We need to make sure that when our customers are saying, okay, well, here's our, here's our hypotheses, here's how we came to that conclusion, yeah. um, that there's enough there to constitute, okay, yeah, we're comfortable moving forward. Yeah. Right, because we've had a variety of customers and some say it's this exact subset of customers and they've been right. But I'd say the majority of times, you know, it hasn't been exactly as as we set out. Yeah, and the way I think about it is like usually the companies have a really strong understanding of sort of the nucleus of the value they offer and who they offer it for, but there's this last mile that uh, is sort of necessary for outbound to work where you're digging into very specific personas who need very specific things and it has to do with that bar of email being risen um, mm -hmm. where you can't your sort of nucleus sort of core messaging just isn't enough you have to kind of go a little step further and personalize it uh, and and really articulate that uh, hitting the nail on the head of, of, of associating yourself with what your prospects already want because you it's not a matter of manufacturing new want it's a matter of sort of uh, you know, connecting yourself, your brand, your your product, your service to what they already want, and uh, and that's something that you know is is very hard to do, and because it's it's sort of invisible to you, um, so you can make guesses and you can test them, and, and eventually it will illuminate itself uh, if you do that systematically. But if you sort of just do stabbing in the dark and going off of your gut instincts, um, there's a light. You're you're more likely than not to sort of miss the actual shape of the market and mm -hmm. and and potentially leave a lot of money on the table in the process. So. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is one of those things that drove me crazy in the early days of you know trying to be a little bit data, trying to be data driven, trying to really learn from each of our customers, and trying to figure out why some customers were successful and others failed. That racked my brain, like wrecked my brain for a long time. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, like I, I wanted more of an, I wanted more of a reason than well, some customers are better than than others, right? Because yeah. like to me, that just wasn't acceptable. It's like there's got to be something to on the service delivery. There's got to be something on the messaging. There's got to be something here. And I think at the end of the day, what it like the, what this helped us answer is that, you know, my initial hypothesis was okay, well, it's product market fit, right? And some companies have it, and some companies don't, which was partially true. And I, I think. You know the the addendum I'd make to that is that you know whether or not you have product market fit, it's it's more about your ability to communicate it throughout the sales process. Yeah, that's actually a really good point because a lot of companies they have sort of a reliable or at least like uh, you know have a, a quite a track record of sort of inbound uh, that maybe started with their network and uh, people they know well and then sort of trickled up like expanded from that through word of mouth. Uh, maybe it had to do with sort of the some some layer of hype in the market that has subsided, um, or just they've you know reached a certain uh, threshold in sort of their market adoption that uh, now they they want to push harder and they want to start using outbound. And to go from that sort of inbound to outbound, uh, there's a you know a basically a, a higher bar of your understanding of your product market fit. So even if you have it and you sort of have some evidence as to you know, what sort of language you've used in your marketing that has turned into leads. Mm -hmm. um, when you're trying to start a one-to-one -one conversation uh, in a way that you know, people don't feel like they're just being blasted with marketing uh, spam, then uh, you basically have to, uh, have to go deeper. And that's the, that's the thing that I think um, you know, there, there was an inconsistency among our clients in terms of how deep they had gone, and we realized that you know, we needed to take responsibility for filling in that gap. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our process is, is you know, fairly simple, but it, it isn't necessarily intuitive, um, I find. And I think once, once you hear it, it sounds obvious in hindsight, but, um, but for a lot of companies, I think it, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it just isn't instinctual, basically. So mm -hmm. people aren't kind of defaulting to this sort of stuff. Um, so with all that said, I should probably just dive into it. Yeah, and just before you do, I just want to do a quick adjustment here because you're you're just you're running away from us on camera there. There you go. Right. And so we'll we'll try and stay shoulder to shoulder. It's a weird thing; you can't see it, but you in order to fit both of us in uh, in the screen, we have to be sort of like touching elbows here. And so maybe I just haven't showered in a couple of days, and Kenny's like, oh, I need to get away from this guy. But I'll um, yeah. 
so yeah with that said and, and with the the readjustment made let's sure. uh, let's jump into uh sure so um i think it, it starts going back to that four pillars and we're so we're really trying to zero in on targeting and messaging and so when you're thinking about targeting you're trying to isolate a group of people uh who who all want the same thing and you're trying to connect your product to what they want and so something that you know this concept that we've been kind of playing around with internally is this thing we call chain of relevance and it's very similar to um, you know what Aaron wrote about in the book um, impossible to inevitable, impossible to inevitable uh, about nailing a niche. Um, but really, it has to do with you know trying to isolate that group of a specific group of people who all want the same thing in the right in the same context, and connecting that to your product in a way that uh, you know is very easy for everyone to understand to your for your salespeople for the prospects, and being able to start conversations uh, off and right foot. So. The targeting, unfortunately, you can't target people based on what they want. You have to come up with sort of creative strategies that uh, you know can leverage existing uh, methods that are out there. So you know, very commonly, people will target based on the size of the company or the industry or uh, obviously job titles, and and so all those things can usually get you kind of close, but they're just correlated. They're not necessarily. It's not perfect. It's like a proxy for exactly. an actual need. Exactly. So um, you know, and this is where target account lists can come into play down. You know, as you sort of develop your understanding is because often these things aren't searchable in databases you have to do a little extra deeper research um, you know sometimes you can play crawlers or things like that but for the most part you know it helps to just go from website to website for from company to company and really dig in but before you get there you really need to be able to understand well what are the parameters that I'm looking for here mm -hmm. and you know the first step is usually interviewing customers um, that's kind of the best way to make the most progress as fast as possible um, starting with customers you already have and then you know kind of going approaching some of your existing sales conversations with much much greater priority to curiosity than anything else if you think this client I'm really not even going to try and sell them anything I'm just going to do my best to understand them as best as I can um, and, and see what comes out of that afterwards if you start with that type of an attitude I think uh, that will kind of expedite this process but ultimately what we do is we take a client's sort of theory as to that uh, fit for each uh, whole bunch of different segments of customers. So basically all the segments of customers that they think are relevant. So you know the types of companies they work in and the types of people and basically their role in their organization. Mm -hmm. And we try to map out like what do we think that they want. Um, and we do this by you know, using these jobs to be done statements. And so a jobs to be done statement is something that you can really define and, and you can tell this is a job to be done or this isn't. And I'm leaning on something uh, developed by someone called Anthony Ulwick called Outcome Driven Innovation. Um, but basically, it's this way of kind of structuring the state, the jobs to be on statement such that it's like a verb and then an object of control and a context. And that probably sounds super weird, but when you kind of see it on the screen, it'll make sense. So things like um, listen to music at home. So listen is the verb, to music is the object of control and at home is the context. And you can imagine comparing listen to music at home with maybe like listen to music on the subway. And so these are the jobs to be done that, the, that the, basically the consumer, the customer cares about. But immediately, because these are familiar jobs to us, we can probably imagine that they have different products that would kind of suit them best. And there might be different ways to engage people in those in sort of uh, conversation about those products. Um, you know, why would you want to listen at home? Well, maybe because you're going to host a party or you're going to, uh, you know, want to listen to music while you clean or something like that. Why are you, you're listening to music on the subway, uh, you know, maybe because you're trying to tune out everything else around you and uh, maybe you want more noise canceling and things like that. So the sort of features that, that uh, inform those products will be different. Um, and so when you're applying that to B2B, um, Usually you want to connect it at the top level to uh, sort of a goal that the company has or at least the specific person's higher one of their highest priorities and that can always be done. Um, but if you're uh, you know if you're going if you're being rigorous about this process then then usually we get pretty close. And part of that comes from this understanding that when you have a job to be done, let's say listen to music at home, um, there's almost always or there always is always sort of a, a higher order uh, job to be done. That is like the reason why you would want to do that. So in the previous example I mentioned, you know, maybe you really want to listen to music at home because you wanted to host a party or you wanted to, um, you know, listen to music while you clean to kind of help the time go by faster. 
Um, but there's also the underneath that, there's the how. So it's like, how are you going to listen to music at home? Well, you know, a hundred years ago, maybe you would have uh, been, you would have gone and found a record and you would have bought a record player and you would have set it up and maybe there's something you need to do to maintain that record player and you probably had to clean the record off. And you know, so all these kind of like steps. And, uh, and nowadays you might, you know, just oh, take your phone out and uh, Chromecast your TV or something like that or your stereo system and start, start playing from there. So, um, but you know, when it breaks you down uh, to be more sort of um, a little bit more agnostic to the solution, you'll find that there's usually steps you have to follow. You, like, you need to basically find a playlist or like a, of songs to to listen to. Uh, you need to set that up. You need to turn it on. You might need to adjust the volume. Like there's going to be these consistent things that that are always followed, and and that's devoid of any sort of specific solution. And so these are what we're looking for with our clients: is this relationship between sort of what's the core job to be done that they're trying to achieve, and why are, do they care about that job, and how are they currently thinking about getting that job done. And so you basically come up with a bunch of different jobs beyond statements. It's like a brainstorming exercise we do. And, you, and, and we kind of build this mind map where there's like a hierarchy, where at the top you've got the sort of core motivations. And really, you can keep going higher and higher and higher. And when you start reaching things like, I want my company to be successful, or you know, I want to be a responsible executive, or you know, I want to be the best VP sales I can be, or something like that, you're basically hitting this point of values. And if you can be even more specific than those things, that's even better. But basically, you kind of hit, tend to hit values at the very top. Um, are very, very abstract goals. And then when you get down to the bottom, you kind of hit these really tactical things that most people are going to just glaze over, and especially depending on who you're reaching out to in an organization, uh, they might not really be able to connect with. And so really what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a sweet spot that's somewhere in the middle that sort of probably connects two concepts, some goal, and then some sort of like tactical way of getting that uh, goal met or that job done. Um, and, and, and that's framed in the right way for a prospect so that it resonates with them. And they go, oh, wow, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. And that's the thing I care about right now. And I think the last remaining piece of the puzzle here is that whenever you're faced with a goal or a job to be done, and you're trying to map all this out, um, there's uh, the sort of relevancy in why people would care and want to be, you know, explore your product or your, or your service, is that um, they face obstacles and friction in getting the job done. So. You not only do you want to articulate like the progress you help people make, but you also want to basically try and identify what are the obstacles that they face, uh, or the friction that they face in getting that progress met. Um, and that could be something that maybe you know they want to make the progress, but they haven't even tried yet because they're afraid X might happen, or they're pretty sure Y might happen, uh, and they don't want those things to happen, so they're afraid to even try. Or it could be something that they're already doing. It's just that it's this thorn in their side. This, this you know, X keeps happening, and we want to stop that from happening. Um, and it's usually the obstacle um, connected to the job to be done, which is then connected to this higher order goal. When you can connect those three things um, in just the right way, it's usually a good way to start the conversation. Because of course, sales conversations and these solutions are more complicated than just three data points. But when you're trying to be extremely succinct in an email or a LinkedIn message or a cold call, and you want to just basically start that conversation off on the right foot with the right context, these three things tend to be sort of the necessary components we've found. And, and it's what we lean on when we do an outbound validation. Cool. And just just one more time. So what were the three? Th just so because I find some sometimes you just need to say things a couple times. Of course. So yeah. what are the, what are the top three things that you or the three things that you really need to connect together? Yeah. So um, it's going back to that chain of relevance. And so basically, the goal that a prospect has um, that you think of it as sort of one of their top priorities for the for the quarter. Um, something that is like they, they would articulate in their own words that they care about, mm -hmm. um, but is maybe kind of abstract and can be solved in a lot of different ways. So that's one piece. And then the second piece is sort of a, a subset of that progress. So one of the jobs to be done that will help them accomplish the goal um, that uh, they will logically be able to associate to the goal, but maybe haven't yet. So it might be that they never haven't considered trying to get the job done that way or trying to accomplish the goal in that way. But as soon as you mention it, it's going to be really obvious that those two things are connected, especially if you mention them both in the same, in the same message. And then the third piece is an obstacle that's getting in their way. And you know, sometimes you might mention two obstacles, but generally you're trying to keep these things really succinct. Um, and so it's really that higher order goal, that sort of progress that they really care about, the thing that they really want, and then the, the sort of lower order job to be done, which is really what they need to accomplish their goal. So now you're connecting a want with a need, and then the obstacle that's getting in the way of them either getting the job done or accomplishing the goal, 
which is again something you know it's like kind of connected with the need and the want they want to overcome that obstacle so or they need to overcome that obstacle to get what they want um, so yeah it's connecting those three things and that's sort of the 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 middle of the chain of relevance so on one so that's the middle on one end you've got the prospect and the company so basically who it is who you're targeting and then on the other end you have your solution and you know, logically your solution should be obvious how your solution can essentially help them overcome that obstacle get the job done and all, and then accomplish their goal Cool. And we, we got some screenshots of some slides that we're going to include that have an example that you've kind of mapped out. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll pick it from the SaaS doc slides. Sure. And we'll we'll throw a couple of, uh, of screenshots in there. So if you're sitting there going, what the fuck did Kenny just say? <laughs> <laughs> um, have a look in the show notes. We'll include links to, uh, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll try and put it in there as like a, a link to an image so you can open it up on your mobile or wherever you are. Um, and if you do want the full set of slides, just uh, drop either of us an email and uh, we'll send them your way. Yeah. All right, so, so take, us, uh, take us back to the chain. Sure, so yeah, I mean, uh, here's another example that maybe is a bit more tangible. Um, let's say you wanted to increase revenue. So increase is a verb, revenue is the object in control uh, with outbound, so that's the context. So basically you've decided that you have a goal to um, basically increase your revenue with outbound. Uh, you know, one of the jobs to be done, for instance, is going to have to be, is going to be build a target account list or build a target account list. Another job to be done is, you know, write, uh, write messaging to send to prospects. And so here's an example where you've got a goal, you've got two tangible jobs to be done that set on, sits on that goal, and then maybe you face obstacles like uh, with the, you know, building the target account list, you're, you're not quite sure how to uh, zero in on the right accounts. Maybe so you don't like your obstacle is that you don't really know how to build the account list. Uh, another might be that um, maybe the, the 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 attributes that you think make up your ideal customer profile aren't things you can search for online. That's really common, um, where you can't just go into you know Discover Org or Zoom Info and, and and do a query and 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 search by these parameters that you believe helps you isolate your your target account list. Um, and when it comes to let's say writing messaging, you know. A common obstacle that we find our clients face is that they don't really know what they should say uh, in the in the in the message, right? Like they have ideas, but they don't really know what's going to work best. Yeah. Um, and so that you know, there's an example of those three things. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, so the next question is, well, okay. So when you have these sort of abstract concepts, what do you do with them? And so what we do is we do this brainstorming exercise, like I mentioned, and we kind of do it with sticky notes. So sometimes we'll do them with real, literal, physical sticky notes, but a lot of time we do them online with like a sort of a shared whiteboard sticky note sort of tool. And which which tool is that? Uh, so we've been using Miro. Cool. Um, yeah, and it, it works quite well. But uh, I think there's a lot of them out there. Uh, there's probably some free ones. Uh, I think. Yeah. Anyways, so. <clears throat> We um, so after we've done this brainstorm, we've this we consider this sort of our loose theory of market fit with a client. So it's a you know it's got sort of people and companies and the goals and the jobs and the obstacles all sort of mapped out in a bit of a hierarchy and you know certain goals and jobs fit under certain people and you know other ones fit under other people and they're all sort of re relevant to the product or the service that we're trying to uh, market, but they're not. Um, there, it's like it's not as if we found one thing that we know is going to work. Uh, mainly, usually we have lots of ideas, lots of guesses. So the next step is to test them. And so uh, basically, before we can start testing them, we have to kind of break them down into more explicit um, campaigns or, or experiments. And so we basically take this sort of loose theory and we break it down into individual hypotheses. And this is where the chain of relevance comes in because you know we've got this sort of hodgepodge of ideas, and we're going to take you know this type of company and this type of prospect or this you know way of targeting a prospect and this goal and this job to be done and this obstacle and maybe this way of framing what the solution is so it could be something really simple like it's software or it's um, you know a, a prospect database or um, it's you know automation tools or you know like it might we'll try to de describe it in two or three words but it's what's the two or three words that's going to provide sort of the right context to the prospect so that they know what it is they're thinking about um, we don't go into lots of any details about pro uh, features or anything like that um, and so we basically in our sort of uh, from our brainstorm then we build out this matrix where each row is one of these chains of relevance where you've got type of company type of prospect goal job to be done, obstacle, and then sort of a way of very briefly describing what the solution is. And uh, in the, when we do it, the first round, we'll do 20. So we'll literally map out 20 guesses. And sometimes we, you know, we kind of recycle certain ways, that, like certain goals and certain jobs to be done. We'll try on two or three different targetable audiences. 
Um, and so, you know, we might have, let's say, like five or six sort of good ideas around ways to frame the value and five or six, you know, uh, good ideas for groups of people to target um, specifically. And then we can kind of like mix those up and we end up easily with 20 different individual hypotheses to test. And then each one will go out and we'll test on a significant sample size. And right now with email, we're anchoring that between three and 500 people. Um, because uh, basically, you know, across the board metrics wise, we're seeing, you know, pretty commonly if you sort of average everything out, especially when we're making sort of these uh, original guesses that don't have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, existing historical knowledge behind them. In yeah, terms I mean, of they're, they're guesses, they're hypotheses, exactly. they're un, in, by definition unproven. So when you average it all out, we tend to see something around, you know, 0 0.1 to 0.2 percent conversion. But what almost always happens is that one or two of the guesses of the hypotheses will perform exponentially better than the rest. So we get like basically like a power law distribution where, uh, you know, maybe 80 or 90 percent of the positive results will come from, you know, five to 10 percent of the ideas tested. And so when you average it all out, the metrics aren't great, but there'll always, almost always be one or two campaigns that perform on email somewhere between like one and maybe three or four percent. And, uh, and then that's what we're looking for, is that like we've identified, we basically identified the niche. It's like we found a group of people who all seem to share a similar need and we have a way to start that conversation with them uh, that now we can go and take to other channels and, and apply some you know, better, sort of better practices when it comes to uh, getting more results from that segment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's really interesting the um, just how it's segmented, and if you're if you're designing your email templates just to get sort of average, you know, the average conversion rates, like they're bad, right? If you're seeing a point one convert point one percent conversion rate, it's not good. Yeah, um, and so the whole idea here, it's like it, it almost it's almost mis. In some ways, it's informative and misleading at the same time when we talk about the average conversion rate because you're not looking for the average conversion rate. Yeah. We're looking for that power law distribution. We're looking for that, okay, where can we get 2 to 5% sort of conversion rate as opposed to 0.1. Yeah. But when you average it out, like, for example, the couple ones, the, the magic moment for me when I look at sort of these OV templates that you guys do, it's the, you'll see 40 tests. Right, or 40 different hypotheses, and we've gone and we've run a campaign of like 300 to 500, and there's like just diabolical results, just nothing. <laughs> and then you'll see like a lot of zeros, <laughs> yeah, you'll see tons of zeros, and you'll see one, and you're like, oh, that's interesting. And you scroll a little farther, yeah. and there's really like and out of 40 tests, there'll be anywhere from two to five, yeah, uh, campaigns that are hypotheses that like really hit it out of the park, yeah, right. And like, th this is exactly what, I, what we were talking about earlier. Sometimes you are lucky enough to stumble on this magical combination. Yeah. And sometimes it means you're good, and sometimes it means you're lucky. And it's impossible to know which is which. Yeah. Which is why I just want to reinforce like, this is the sort of, this is why you need a more strategic and uh, process driven approach for identifying this. Because out of that 40, right, like, what is that, one in 25% odds? Uh, of getting it right the first time? Yeah, about that. I'd say it's about one in 20, I would think. Yeah. To, to get that, that niche that's going to really get you the exponentially better results. In, in the variations, the, they're not that significant, significantly different. It's not like we're testing 40 different markets. No, no, we'll probably be testing. I mean, ultimately, like a lot of our clients will think, you know, well, we can go after really any vertical or any size company. And oh, I love hearing that. And, and, <laughs> and sometimes, you know, that can be true to extend. Usually if it's any vertical, there is actually a specific sort of stage that a company is going through that's, that matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, or they, it is ver there is vertical specific. They just haven't quite realized that yet because it hasn't been substantially uh, tested. Yeah. But, um, you know, ultimately, when we go from sort of that level of understanding to, you know, breaking it down and say, okay, well, why don't we test these four verticals, these specific sizes of companies, and these specific people in those companies? Uh, and you know, because we have so much experience, it's easy. It's easier for us to draw on all these examples that we can think of in the past with past clients where they got results here or there, or didn't get results here and there, and mm -hmm. what types of things resonate with that types of people. And I think just building your own business, you kind of learn what, like, which roles in the company care about which things. And so sometimes we can bring some of that. Extra expertise into the equation with our clients and help mm -hmm. drive um, better quality hypotheses. That's part of the process too. Um, but we've had a lot of clients that they don't need the help at all. And they have stuff, this stuff you know, fairly well understood. And it, so they have all these ideas and they're well sort of well educated ideas. And the only thing that's missing is the sort of testing at scale. Mm -hmm. So we're really just taking everything they know and breaking it down into these explicit sorry, hypotheses and then testing like 20, uh, what we do, four, up to 40 
uh, experiments in about a two-month window. Uh, it's about a th three-month process in total with the workshops and everything, and then going into the experiments. But uh, yeah, and, and that that sort of power law distribution in the results is is really the the value of it all because um, you know in, in any given engagement there'll usually be a bunch of zeros uh, or like a bunch of ones, meaning we get like maybe one meeting booked. So you know maybe there's like if 20, we do 20 experiments, uh, we might see you know 15 campaigns that basically get nothing, and then two or three that get like a couple, like barely sort of a pattern, but they get something, and then uh, one or two that sort of ha like where all the results come from, and maybe they'll get five or even 10 meetings booked um, from 500, uh, from you know about 500 prospects. And the, the other thing that can happen is you know because we're testing these different combinations of targeting and messaging is. Sometimes when we do get, let's say, five or six campaigns that all get like one or two result, um, when we dig deeper, we realize sometimes, not always, but sometimes we'll realize like, oh, you know, these are a bunch of different segments of customers, but in every case, we were framing the value in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, our hypothesis in terms of who we targeted and what we said wasn't quite right. But the fact that you know we realized that these like four ways to say something. Um, this was the way that definitely performed exponentially better than any other, and so you know we go into that deeper research. Like we don't just stop at the hypotheses we made. We do our best to learn from them, and especially when we got them wrong, we we're trying to figure out well what can we learn from this? Like what did we? If, was there anything buried in here we did get right, or mm -hmm. was there something else that maybe we can learn from that we didn't even think to consider? Like um, maybe ge geography matters, and we didn't build that into any of our hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. And I think the interesting piece here, just a note, is that there's. It's not just one sort of go of 40, like 40 hypotheses. It's yeah. two different cohorts of 20. Yeah. So you start with your initial, maybe like, are they a bit higher level? Um, and then with the second round, you go, you drill in a little bit lower, or is it just sort of across the board? Um, you know, every engagement's a little bit different, and it kind of depends on like how many ideas the client has to, uh, you know, go with. And I'd say like one of the, this is the thing that's actually I think really interesting about it because. A lot of if any marketers that are listening to this right now, you know, they're probably thinking, well, this is like basic marketing stuff. Like we, you know, come up with hypotheses, and you know, I met, like I've used the AdWords interface a fair bit, and uh, you know, I know you basically come up with all these ideas for ads you can run and ways you can target people, and then uh, Google sort of just figures it out for you in terms of it shuts down the ads that don't don't convert well. So you know, there, this isn't too much different than that. But the the key difference that actually is really really material is that we're engaging people in actual sales conversations. And so rather than just tracking a conversion rate like a click, um, when, when things don't work and like our campaigns essentially aren't getting positive responses, they're usually getting some sort of neutral or negative response. And people are usually explaining to us why, because we're asking them like, hey, is this relevant to you? Like, hey, do you care about these things? Is there someone else in your team that you know, maybe cares about these things more than you do? Uh, that's part of how we reach out to people. And, uh, and so that elicits all of this learning that you know, even if we do have a bit of a flop in the first round, usually we have some really good ideas as to why and what to try next. And so sometimes, like we in the first round, you know, we might have ideas for 30 campaigns, and we limit it to only the or sort of 20 best guesses. And then um, when we go into the second round, we don't even bother with those other 10 guesses that we sort of called because we learn such interesting fundamental things from the negative responses that we have much better sort of uh, well, much more well-informed ideas for this for the following round. So, so tell me about how you do that because there's and, and we don't have to get into the software element of it because mm -hmm. you know we have some stuff that makes it easier. Yeah. Um, but you could do this with setting up you know labels and outreach or sales loft or Gmail. Yeah. And yeah. so can you talk to me about when you're looking at the results of the positive, you know, positive, neutral, negative, or, or specifically, let's say, let's say the neutral and negative, how is it that you're getting the, these learnings? Yeah, okay, so I think like the first kind of thing that, that helps drive the responses themselves that I kind of just glazed over a moment ago is that you know, in our initial email we send out to people, we'll be talking about the goal, the obstacle, and the job to be done, and, and maybe a little tiny high-level thing about the product. And then, um, we, when, we, when we do follow-ups, because everyone, uh, I'm assuming, is familiar with the idea of cadences and sequences and things like that, uh, you know, we're not, uh, the other thing is the call to action in the email is not uh, trying to get them on a call. We're asking them basically a question. Like the call to action is, hey, answer my question. Do you want this? Do you care about this? Does this matter to you right now? Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a very different, like people tend to be a little bit less sort of guarded because of the way we do that. Uh, and then when we follow up, we'll follow up with something like, 
you know, uh, is there someone on your team that you know, cares more about this or is, you know, uh, better suited to, you know, for us to talk to? Um, are you the ideal person to talk to? Some, some variation of that, we're constantly testing sort of different ideas, but they're all trying to get, basically get at the same question, which is like, can you refer us to someone else that cares more? And then the last one will usually be something like, um, hey, do you mind letting me know if this isn't relevant to you because like, I don't want to waste your time and, uh, you know, or bother you? And, and we tend to stop there. And so it's kind of, the last one's kind of like a breakup email, but really we're trying to elicit, we're trying to get them to tell us, no, thank you, that this doesn't matter to me, before <laughs> to elicit those learning, like we were just saying. Yeah. So once we get the responses, so that's like how we get the responses, but once we get them, we go through a process where, you know, we call it inboxing. Um, but essentially we're, you know, we're conversing with the prospects, um, but when, in every sort of conversation or, or sort of exchange in the dialogue, um, especially particularly when they contact us, we classify that response. And, um, you know, the high level we classify it as either positive, neutral, or negative. But then underneath those, we have some specific classifications and custom classifications that has to do with, you know, things like, um, you know, I'm referring you to the right person, or I'm, uh, you know, interested, to, you know, basically some sort of a handoff or, or, or book meeting, or, you know, validating that they have, a, a, you know, a, an actual need, like, uh, but they want to talk about it later, so it's kind of like contact me later, but if you've done enough of this, you'll notice that there can be uh, sort of a spectrum of sentiment when it comes to a statement like that. And sometimes it's pretty obvious you're just getting blown off, and sometimes they, they sort of take enough time to craft the email in a way, like their response to you in a way that you can tell that they actually do care about this and it is mm -hmm. relevant to them. Yeah. And you are just, uh, they just are too busy right now. So they're, they're being honest. And so you know, depending on how they respond, we basically classify them in these buckets so that at the end of the round of experiments, we can look and, and go, you know, how did certain classifications align with certain hypotheses and things like that? And, and uh, you know, some of those will be custom to the client and some of them are pretty generic across all our clients. Um, I just want to add, like, we use our own software to do this, but this isn't an ad for the software. We don't sell that software. It's just yeah. something that we built to help make this easier. Um, this is something that you can build into your Sales Left Outreach Salesforce stack. Um, all you basically need is, like, um, we call it outbound validation. Create a new field that says, like, outbound validation classification, yeah. right? And then within that field, there's a pick list. And then just make sure that within Sales Loft or Outreach, you can select. You can either, um, you either have a way of filling out that pick list uh, as you're responding to emails, or you can create tags in your, in your email, in your sale, uh, Sales Loft Outreach, and then you can have those tags. Um, I think you can set... Uh, I think you basically can set an automation that says if this, if it finds a conversation with this tag, then fill it out with that, right? So it's basically an if, if this, then that statement. Um, there are other ways, and I'm sure there are people on here that are that are listening that are way way better at sales ops than I am. Um, but the, the point the point I'm trying to make is there's no there's there's no one specific software solution for this. The whole idea here is that you just need to while you're in the act of classifying. So before you're before you're handling your message, you need to set up the classifications that you want to score for. Yeah. And then second off, you need to make it really easy for the person who's handling those messages to apply a classification, to know what that classification is, apply it and have it pushed into your Salesforce so that you are pushed into wherever you're tracking your experiments. Because um, at the end of the day, if you don't have this data, I mean, how like the last time you had to do this and you did it manually, mm -hmm. what was the, we were talking time-wise. Um, so w with one client, um, it was actually the first time I'd gone through it. We've sort of improved our process since then, but I think we spent around seven hours. Uh, so it was about, it was about six weeks of experiments had been run, 20, 20 experiments, uh, full round. And um, we wanted to reclassify I think it was about 10% of the conversations, like the engagement we got, which was somewhere around, you know, 5,000 responses or something like that, maybe a little less, uh, 4,000, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we're talking, you know, we basically had to reclassify somewhere around four or 500 conversations, and that took about five or six hours or something like that. Yeah, so I am not being super super precise in this, but yeah. uh, but it, it was, was like it was, was a full day yeah. fair, at the at the minimum. Yeah, yeah. So this is a, a vote for get this stuff set up ahead of time is yeah. the important message I'm trying to get across. Yes, yes. So that you don't have to go and spend because it was five or six hours for what percentage of the conversation? Ten or twenty Ten, percent? Yeah, exactly. So basically, it could be a whole week to go back and, and look through. 
Um, and nobody wants to do that. It's just a, it's a crazy amount of work. It's not going to get done. You say it might get done, but it's not going to get done. So make sure you set it up ahead of time, whether, you know, no matter what systems you're, you're using or tools you're using, um, and just make sure you have that so that you can pull the data out at the end, because it's not only, you know, it's not only critical to look at the ones at the winners, but it's also like Kenny said, super insightful to look at the ones that didn't win and, yeah. and to be able to understand the reasons why. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, it's, you know, all, like kind of o overview of everything again, you know, you're, you're coming up with these, this theory as to your market fit, like who are all the various types of people and, and uh, that care about, like, like would want what you're selling and why. And then you're breaking those down into hypotheses, um, you know, kind of using the chain of relevance to build a single hypothesis. And um, you're testing those with a sample size, uh, if you're using email, a sample size of somewhere between three and 500 prospects. And the, 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 the point of it all is to learn you know, what resonates with who and sort of how and why and why are certain things not resonating with certain people. And the answers to all those questions are in the actual replies you get from prospects. And so if you're not classifying those replies and really breaking down those metrics and then associating those back to the hypotheses you made, you're missing the final step in the basically the learning process. And if you can kind of build this into your culture of your team, you can do it constantly. Like, you do, like we do 20 and then 20 because we're trying to do it as fast as possible. We basically wanted this like industrial, robust sort of... Accelerated <laughs> learning. Yeah, like it's, we want to be as fast as possible. Um, but everyone's going to get benefit from this, even if you're, let's say, only doing five a month instead of 20. Um, and especially if you've got a team of you know, five people, they could each take on one. As long as you're organizing everyone, they're all following some or a similar process, and they're all sort of uh, classifying the responses in the same way and reporting the metrics in the same place, you're going to get a great be benefit from it. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it, it'll take a little bit of time, I think, to get everybody on board with that. But mm -hmm. it's totally worth it. 100%. And I, I think if you look, like, do you want a... A one in twenty percent stab in the dark, or sorry, a one in twenty stab in the dark, five percent chance uh, of hitting it, or do you want something that's a little bit more um, process oriented? And it's not, and it can't you can't guarantee that hey, if you follow this process, you're going to nail it because you know we you know we don't know what sort of situation every company that's listening is, but I can guarantee that this is going to give you a better than one in twenty opportunity to to find that right sort of niche, that right messaging. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because when you look at sort of the I mean, I, I don't know if I'm associating two things that shouldn't be associated here, but I just like coming from the product management side and um, really thinking deeply about startups and, and how they can be successful. And, you know, that's kind of like the thing that got me into all this is looking at why do startups fail and, and realizing the most common reason they fail is this sort of uh, lack of product market fit or lack of market demand. Um, and one of the interesting metrics around that that's been um, published quite a bit, but I think like CB Insights tends to be a leader in publishing this metric. Mm -hmm. And it's around 5% of uh, startups or new products succeed uh, in the market. Like that's kind of the baseline. And uh, funny enough, like in all of our experiments, like we tend to see about 5% of the ideas we come up with in terms of trying to do like, uh, like outbound, successful outbound campaigns tend to work as well. So. Um, you know, the answer to the startup problem was, you know, lean startup and sort of applying the scientific method and trying to do more uh, faster, cheaper iterations of your product market fit. Uh, and this is really just following the same sort of theory. It's just we've kind of taken the idea of using the scientific method and applied it to these this specific context. And and funny enough, the, the ratio of sort of success to failure seems to follow what uh, it does for the companies as a whole. So. Yeah, it's it's funny. I don't I don't remember the exact data that came out of it, but the I think the startup genome project that followed thousands of startups for a couple of years, they've had they had the same findings in that the number one cause of failure among startups was premature scaling. Yeah. Right? They before they were trying to invest and in, move into sales and marketing mode before they truly had found and developed product market fit. They found a little spark of something, they got a little bit excited and they jumped into it. Right. right before you had everything nailed and so like maybe you had product market fit maybe they did maybe they didn't but they certainly couldn't communicate it and they weren't mature enough to have the case studies and all the research and all that to back it up yeah. and they just sort of jumped full on into you know let's let's move into scaling mode yeah. uh, and that was the i think the number one cause of failure for uh, that they had attributed uh, all those startups and that, that was something that's kind of stuck with me for a long time mm -hmm. um for sure and so before we close, I got one more question for you, um, but can we just do a recap of the sort of resources that we're going to share out so that somebody can try and replicate this internally? Sure. So um, basically we have a, a slide that sort of uh, explains like a, or a slide deck that explains 
the theory behind it, um, sort of jobs to be done theory and sort of this relationship of the why and the how, um, sort of the hierarchy of motivation behind you know, the progress people were trying to make that you know, your product can help them make, um, and, and how to think about obstacles and the chain of relevance and all these things. And it basically gets you up to the point where you can do that brainstorming exercise. And we can also share a template of what we call our matrix or a market fit matrix. Um, which is where you take sort of the brainstorming exercise and you sort of convert that into these explicit hypotheses, uh, individual rows of chains of relevance that you can test explicitly. Um, and, uh, and then from there, you know, I think it's up to you to use, you know, whatever uh, tools you normally use to do your outreach to actually execute on it. So I don't think we'll go into too much specifics around that, but uh, I'm happy to answer people's questions if anyone wants to reach out with me with a question. Cool. Uh, so what's the best way for them to get in touch? Uh, LinkedIn. Cool. For sure. Find me on LinkedIn. Ken McKenzie. Anybody. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll, I'll track down your LinkedIn and I'll fire, uh, fire it in the show notes there so everybody's got it there. Sure. Cool. So one, one sort of last question and, um, you know, I will throw it out there this sort of that you mentioned, you know, if anybody's got questions or if there's, we haven't really played around with this, with the idea that much, but if anybody's interested in like having us run one of these, like just run one of these, if you have an SDR team, um, you know, reach out, call on at predictablerevenue.com. Um, I'd love to hear from you. It's it's not something that we're really we're doing that much, uh, or that we're doing outside of just sort of uh, outside of the OV program. Um, but it it is something that uh, we sort of considered. So if you're listening, it sounds interesting. You know, uh, shoot me a note, and we'll uh, we'll try and line something up. But uh, I've got one one last question for you. I'm, I'm curious. Like you put a lot of time and, and effort into this. Why why share all this information out right now? Hmm. Um. I think, I mean, I have a lot of reasons, a lot of answers to that. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to say it succinctly here. You know, uh, for one, I think we have a value that we we just believe in sharing information and, and especially things like this, like if it's going to help people as a whole, we want to, uh, like, you know, all the insights we gain, glean from outbound labs, if it's ever something that we think that other people can benefit from, we like to share that. It's just sort of a cultural norm for us. Um, I think it's something that I'm personally uncomfortable with and, and, and sort of feel good about, and I think you do too. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think, you know, further to that, it's um, like ultimately, I personally really care about seeing companies uh, nail product market fit, and uh, like when businesses are are you know building a product that no one wants, or they have a great product and they can't connect with their market. It, like to me, I see both those things as waste. And so I personally love to try to uh, solve those problems. So that's another reason. And I think, you know, lastly, if I'm going to be like a little honest from like the more, I'd call it otherish or win-win, like there is some benefit to us too, is that, you know, you're going to, uh, some people watching this will um, realize that it could help them and they'll go to start doing it and they'll make some progress and they'll realize that the ex actual execution of a high volume of experiments is challenging. And then maybe they'll come to us and ask for help. Um, but I wouldn't say that's the primary reason. Um, you know, I think in our articles and everything like that, it shows that we just like to share. But uh, but yeah, ultimately, like it's uh, you know we want to help people make this progress one way or another. And if you can do it yourself, even without our help, beyond you know things like this, I think we're all happy. So. Right on. Well, Kenny, thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm, I'm glad I got the opportunity to finally get you on. I've teased it a couple times. Now here it is. Thank you so much. Cool. My pleasure. Cool.